Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship on this Sunday morning. Uh, In the the church's calendar, this Sunday morning is known as Palm Sunday and as Passion Sunday. It's a time when we reflect on the beginning of Holy Week, of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem as king, where people were waving palm branches, and how towards the end of the week on Good Friday, he was crucified upon the cross And this morning in your seats, you might have noticed a little cross made out of uh, palm frond. And so this is a symbol of the journey of Holy Week, of of moving from the celebration of palms to the cross on Friday. And so we we invite you to take that with you this week as a gift from us. Uh, Use it in your prayer time. Put put it somewhere as a reminder of all that Jesus has done for you. And this morning, we're going to really go on, on that journey from Palm Sunday all the way to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so we want to say welcome. If you're new here, I'm Jonathan. I'm the pastor. Um, We'd love to connect with you. There's a connect card in the seat back in front of you if you're online. Welcome as well. Let us know who you are, where you're watching from. Um, And there are giving boxes at each exit, so you can give during the service or after the service there, place any prayer requests or connect cards you have in those places. And uh, this morning, we simply want to say, Welcome. And so I want to read from John chapter 12 with you about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday. Here's what John writes. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, which means save us. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And at first, his disciples didn't understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. And so this morning, as we gather for worship, would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. We are people who who need saving, and so we shout once again, Hosanna. Hosanna. Glory to your name in the highest. God, as we begin this holy week together, we pray that you would let the truths of what happened so long ago rest deep in our hearts this morning, that you would help us experience your love. You'd help us experience your saving power, your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness. And so God, we're coming in here this morning with all sorts of different needs, with all, from all sorts of different places, but we pray that you would meet us here with your power and with your presence this morning. And we ask all this in Jesus' holy name, amen, amen. Well, I invite you to stand, wave to somebody near you, welcome them to worship, and sing with us. i 
remain standing as I read from John 18, the story of Jesus' trial and crucifixion. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not enter the palace. Because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he, if he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves. Judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. They took, this took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you king of the Jews? Is this your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the, Jew, to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for charges against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising.
the kids. If you want to uh, go to our children's ministry environment, Miss Tammy's in the back here. She would love to take you back there. And parents, you can pick them up at the end of the service in the room behind us here. And as we continue on this journey from Palm Sunday to the cross, hear this reading from John chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered here, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. And when Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to him, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to the law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from, Jesus? He asked him. But Jesus gave no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. And from then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. And when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover, and it was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. And finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. As we continue in worship, we invite you to sing with us. You can sit, you can stand, however you feel comfortable.
on Jesus' journey, John tells us the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. And Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Don't write King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I've written, I've written. And when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with his undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. And this happened so that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. And near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. And later, knowing that everything had now been fulfilled, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head. And gave up his spirit. God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you that your son, Jesus, willingly laid down his very life for each and every one of us. And God, this morning, as we reflect on your son on the cross, when all that he has done for us, we pray that you would fill our hearts with your love. We ask this in Christ's holy name, amen. Amen, I invite you to stand and sing in response to the good work that Jesus has done for us.
Silence couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Hey! Well, if you came in sleepy this morning, that'll wake you up. From Reverend S.M. Lockridge, that sermon has now been shared millions of times all around the world. And every time I hear the sermon, it gets me fired up. I think about how powerful the words are, how passionate he is. And every time I hear the sermon, it makes me think about this question, who is my king? Who is my king? And that's really the question I want to put to you this morning. Who is your king? Who is the king, the leader, the ruler, the sovereign ultimate authority over your life? Who is your king? That's the question I want to reflect on this morning. And I want to invite you to continue to reflect on this Holy Week. And now when I say the word king, if you just just close your eyes and think about a king in your mind, I mean, you probably have an image of of a type of person. You probably have an image of a, of a place, maybe a personality, maybe what this person is wearing. Maybe it was somebody a few hundred years ago. Maybe it's somebody who, who you're hoping will succeed the throne, you know, in, in some countries far away. But, but I don't want to talk about those kind of kings this morning. This morning, I want to talk about the king that, that Reverend Lockridge talked about. I want to talk about the king of my life. I want to talk about the king that we've been following as we've been going throughout gospel, the John's gospel the last number of weeks. The king that we read and heard about this morning, King Jesus. King Jesus. You see, Jesus is a different kind of king. He's a different kind of king than the world had ever seen before, than the world has ever seen since. He's a different kind of king than most of us imagine in our minds or have ever even thought about. So I want you to be honest. When when I say the word king and you have an image in your mind, how many of you have an image of a gold crown? Okay, raise your hand. Gold crown, maybe some purple velvet, maybe a palace in a faraway place. Yeah. I don't even know why that is. Like if it's our British roots or, or like some Disney movie we all saw. But like when you ask people in America today their vision of a king, that's what people think of. Someone who's rich. Someone who spends their life around royalty important people and important places, people who have all the resources they could want at their disposal. And, and, and that's the way earthly kings typically operate. But when Jesus walked this earth, he was a different kind of king. He didn't have earthly riches. He wasn't born in a palace. He was born in a stable. He wasn't born into a royal family. He was born into a poor peasant family. And as he grew up, he had the power. He had all power. He could have turned stones into bricks of gold, but he never did that. He never owned his own home. He, he just stayed wherever people would let him. Whoever loved him enough to show him hospitality, that's where he slept. He didn't spend time around royal people and high-class, highfalutin places. No, instead he went to the outcast, the marginalized, the notorious sinners in society, the people that others just pushed to the edge And as you heard a few minutes ago, at the end of his life, when he was given a crown, it was a crown of thorns. He was given a cloak, but it was to mock him. And in his last hours, he spent it next to two criminals. Kings in this world are often rich and surrounded by royalty, but King Jesus, when he walked this earth, chose to be poor and to spend his time with the lowly. And, and, and when you look at, at Jesus' life, I mean, when I think about a king, one of the other things I think about is, maybe this is you, somebody just like feeding grapes into the king's mouth. Anybody have that image in their mind? Like, I don't know where that comes from. But I think about like a king getting what they want, when they want it, however they want it, being domineering, just yelling down, barking orders at other people. That's how earthly kings often operate and keep and sustain and get their power. But Jesus, again, he's different. Jesus, when he was going about his ministry, he said, I came not to be served, but to serve. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, there's an argument with some of the disciples about positions and power and all this kind of stuff. And Jesus says this, the son of man, he's talking about himself, 
didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He's a different kind of king. And there are many other ways that, that he's a different kind of king, but, but in John chapter 18, when we were reading it earlier, I mean, Jesus speaks one of them to Pilate. Because in, in this conversation about, about Jesus' kingship, Jesus says to him, look, my kingdom is not from this world. My kingdom is not of this world. He says, look, if I was a king who, who was like all these other earthly kings, I would have destroyed all y'all by now. There would have been violence. We, we would have been fighting you. I mean, Simon Peter, if you remember, after Jesus is arrested in the garden, takes a sword and cuts a guy's ear off. And what does Jesus say? Put away your weapons. Jesus is saying, I'm a different kind of king. Jesus isn't the kind of king who destroys his enemies. Jesus is the kind of king who dies for his enemies. He's the kind of king who suffers, is beaten, and mocked and hung upon a cross. He willingly dies for his enemies because he loves them. Because he loves his friends. Because he loves people who came before him and because he loves people who came after him. Because he loves me and because he loves you. He laid down his life. He's a different kind of king. And in his very first sermon, in Mark's gospel, he says this. He says, repent and believe the gospel for the kingdom of God is at hand. And what that word repent means is, is basically turn. Turn from your old way of life. Turn from having all these other types of kings. Turn from all of these other people and positions and all these philosophies that are, that are taking authority over your life. Turn and believe in me. Trust in me for my kingdom is at hand. See, Jesus said my kingdom is not from this world, but Jesus' kingdom was for this world. And when we look at Jesus' kingdom that he brought about, and he's bringing about what we find is it's a different kind of kingdom. It's a different kind of kingdom than most of us are used to and can imagine. Because when you think of kingdom, you probably think, like me, of a, of a geographical boundary, right? The king reigns over, over this area, and we usually think about it being time sensitive. The king reigns over this place for a certain amount of time until the people rebel or another king takes over. Kings and kingdoms, we think, you know, they just kind of pass away and they, they cycle through history and then there's democracy and then maybe there's another king. And, and like this is how it goes, but Jesus' kingdom is different because Jesus' kingdom has no geographical boundaries. Jesus' kingdom is open to all people. Jesus' kingdom is made up of all people who repent and believe and say, I want you as my king. And who surrender to him and seek to follow him with their very lives. Jesus' kingdom is also unending. It's unending. There, there is no end. He, he started it when he walked this earth. And when he returns, it will be fully established. Jesus' kingdom is different. He says it's an upside-down kingdom that those who are first in this world will be last in his kingdom and those who are last in this world will be first in his kingdom. So he's saying those who are, who are weak, who are humble, who, who struggle in this life, people who are stomped upon, people who are looked down upon, he's saying, look, in my kingdom, those people are going to be at the top. The proud, the mighty, those who are using destruction and all these negative forces to get their power, they're going to be at the bottom. He says, my kingdom is an upside down kingdom. And one thing I love also about this kingdom being different is that Jesus is a different kind of king and with a different kind of kingdom. He doesn't rule from afar. He's not distant. He's not far off. He's not impersonal, just like shouting orders down at people he doesn't know like we often think of kings doing. Instead, he is a personal king. He is a king who knows everybody in the kingdom by name. He knows their strengths. He knows their weaknesses. He knows their secrets. He knows their, their gifts. He knows what they need. He knows when they need it. And he seeks to give his people what they need right when they need it. He's a different kind of king with a different kind of kingdom. And so... Maybe this helps you understand why on that Palm Sunday, when all those people were, were shouting Hosanna and waving palms and welcoming as, as their king, right? They, they were excited. They were like, here he is. 
He's going to destroy our enemies. He's going to establish a palace here. He's going to take over with force. We are ready for it. Now you understand why, how at the end of the week, when Jesus didn't meet their expectations, people had turned on him. And they were no longer shouting for him to be their king. Instead, they were shouting at him, mocking him on the cross. And they were saying, what kind of king is this? We thought you were going to come rule with power. So they made fun of him. They hurled insults at him. And in Matthew's gospel, we read this. The religious leaders and elders mocking him, saying he saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and then we will believe in him. You see, they didn't get it. They didn't understand. He he was a different kind of king than they had ever seen before. They didn't understand that it was through submission to death on the cross that he was achieving salvation. They couldn't see that, that as he laid down his life, he was making a pathway for everyone in this world to experience life. They couldn't see that as he was lifted up on the cross like a common criminal of the day, that God was exalting him and enthroning him as king. They couldn't see it. They didn't understand it. He was a different type of king with a different type of kingdom. And so instead of crowning him, they killed him. Instead of serving and submitting to him, they shunned him. Instead of worshiping him, they hurled words of insults at him. They made a choice that day how they were going to respond to Jesus. And this morning, what I want you to see is that each of us have to make a choice as well. We have to make a choice. Will we worship him? Will we enthrone him over our lives? Will we serve him? Will we submit to him? Or will we give the top spot in our lives to someone or something else? And over the last number of weeks, we've been going throughout John's gospel. And my hope through all of it has been that as you see Jesus' identity as you see who he is, as you see why he came, as you see the miracles that he did, as you see all of his teachings that took place, my my hope and desire and prayer for you this whole time is that you would make him the king of your life. That, That you would put him in that top spot because when you do that, when you worship and celebrate this different kind of king who's bringing about a different kind of kingdom, you receive a different kind of life. There are great rewards When Jesus is the king of your life. Instead of guilt of your sins, there's forgiveness for your sins. Instead of being a slave to sin, there's freedom over sin. Instead of of, of just a drudgery, boring, no good life here and now, there's abundant life on this earth. Instead of eternal death apart from God, there is eternal life with God. Instead of just being angry and on edge all the time, there is a fullness of the Holy Spirit that will fill you with love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, and so much more. There are great rewards when Jesus is your king. But there are also great responsibilities. And this is something we don't like to talk about a lot of times in churches today. But with the great rewards come great responsibilities. And Jesus says, if you're going to be in my kingdom, I want to give you all these rewards. But I also need you to die to yourself. I also need you to take up your cross and follow me daily. I also need you to be willing to be mocked and made fun of. I also need you not to seek to always be served by other people, but I need you to serve other people. I need you not to seek to destroy your enemies with your words or with your posts or with your actions. No, I need you to love your enemies and have called upon to even lay down your life for your enemies. There are great rewards and there are great responsibilities. But I'll tell you this, Choosing Jesus as your king, no matter the cost, it is always worth it. It's always worth it. 
So I want to ask again, who is the king of your life? There are a lot of people who are trying to get in that top spot. There are a lot of possessions you have that are, that are trying to get into that top spot. There are a lot of philosophies and political ideologies that are trying to get into that top spot. And this is why answering this question, who is your king, it's not, it's not a one and done decision. It's a decision we have to make each and every day. And my hope this morning, this Holy Week, as we move into Easter, and remember not only Jesus' death, but also his resurrection, his victory over the grave, my hope is that you will choose once again that Jesus is your king. Or maybe for the first time, you would say, I want Jesus as my king. I want him as the Lord and the leader and the ultimate authority over my life. And this is a, is a personal decision we each have to make. It's a decision we each have to make in the stillness of our own hearts. And when we choose Jesus as king, we become citizens of his kingdom. We become part of, of this larger family of God. There are great rewards. There are great responsibilities. So today, who will it be for you? My hope is that it'll be Jesus. And over here we have a, we have a cross. And usually it's, it's in this corner and you might not notice it too much, but there are, there's a number of signatures on the cross. This is from a, a few years ago. We asked a similar question and we said, hey, if you want to say yes, Jesus is my king, we invite you to come and sign the cross. And so some of you, if you were here a few years ago, you might find your signature upon that, that cross. And maybe since you signed it, you, you've enthroned someone or something else as your king. And, and this morning, you want to come forward and sign it again and say, you know what? I'm choosing again this day that Jesus is my king. So you can underline your name. You can check it. You can sign it again. And maybe, maybe you weren't here. Maybe you've never thought about who's in the top spot of your life. But maybe this morning you want to say, yeah, Jesus is my king. We invite you to come and, and, to, and to sign this cross as a public declaration. Because although choosing Jesus as your king is a personal decision, there's also a time and a place to declare it publicly. To say, yeah, he is my king. And so in just a few minutes or in just a moment, the band's going to come up and they're going to play another song to help us reflect on the cross. And I invite you, if you want to come forward and kneel here and, and pray or pray in your seat, reflect on who Jesus is and how your life is going, we invite you to do that personally in your chair. And if you'd like to publicly say today, you know what? I'm choosing for the first time or once again, Jesus is my king. If you want to answer that question, S.M. Lockridge said, do you know him? And you want to let people know, we invite you to come and sign it. And so as we prepare our hearts to answer this question once again, would you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? God, we know in this world there are a lot of people and there are a lot of things trying to lead us, fighting for our attention, fighting for authority, fighting for space. There are a lot of things and people trying to get us to submit to them. But God, we celebrate this morning that only you are worthy of our submission. Only you are worthy of our lives. And so God, we pray today, we pray this holy week as we reflect on all that you've done for us, as we reflect upon you, our crucified King, we pray that you would stir in our hearts. We pray that you would move us. We pray that you would give us the courage to say yes to you. Yes to the different kind of life that you're bringing. Yes to the different kind of kingdom that you are beginning in our world and that you will one day bring to completion. 
God, help us to say yes to you and no to all of the other lesser things. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I invite you to to stand and during this final song, um, if you'd like to come forward and sign the cross, uh, we have a basket of markers over there and they'll be sanitized in between people. We invite you to pray. We invite you to reflect on who is king of your life today. Oh, man.
Let's sing out that, uh, that line, here my hope is found, here on solid ground. This morning, I might just sing it out if you believe it. Here my hope is found, here on holy ground, here I bow down, here I bow down, here arms open. you to be seated for, for, for just a moment. Uh, thank you once again for joining us in worship and those online. Thank you for joining us. Uh, sorry you couldn't sign the cross, but you can just declare it in the chat. Jesus is my king. We'd love to see that when we get home. And I want to let you all know just, just a few final announcements. One, feel free to take uh, one of these palm crosses with you just as a, as a token, as a reminder this week, as you reflect on the cross and Jesus's passion. And you can, you can take an extra one and share it with a friend or a loved one as well. And we want to invite you this week, as we move towards Easter, Friday at 7 o'clock p.m., uh, we're going to have a very, very simple prayer time and sharing in Holy Communion um, behind our building uh, in front of the lodge as, where we're going to have our Easter morning services. And we're just going to pray over our property, pray that God would move in power on Easter morning. And so uh, if you'd like to be a part of that gathering, it'll probably last maybe 30 minutes, 7 o'clock on Friday night. Um, Saturday during the day, we're going to be having a work day to, to kind of beautify our campus, get things ready. So you can join us here, just show up, ready to serve. And then on Easter, have you seen the forecast? No, y'all aren't looking at it like I am. Um, it's going to be an awesome day. It's going to be an awesome day. If anything, it's going to be like a touch chilly, right? Which isn't bad right now. So um, it's going to be an awesome, beautiful day. Sunday morning, Easter worship outside here, online, outside, 10.30 a.m. We're going to have a blast. Uh, we invite you to bring your own chair if you'd like, if you have a comfortable camp chair, or we'll have some provided for you as well. It's going to be a family service, all generations worshiping together. Um, we're going we're to see this cross transformed into a symbol of life, remembering and celebrating that Jesus not only died, but he also rose again and gives us new life. 
And so we're going to celebrate that together. We're going to share in Holy Communion together. And afterwards, the kids are going to have an Easter egg hunt on our property. So it is going to be a fun day. Uh, it's going to be outside, a safe environment. So we invite you, invite your friends, invite your family members. Um, this is a day where we're inviting everybody to come and experience Easter together once again in a year that's been full of so many disruptions. Um, so I want to let you know about that. Also, uh, we're going to have a, a lot of flowers, and, and it's going to be beautiful outside. But if you'd like to donate a lily in honor or memory of someone, um, you can simply note on a, on a tither offering check or online uh, that you'd like to give in honor or in memory of someone, and we will purchase one of those and publish that in the bulletin, and you can take that with you after the service. And so you can give online. You can give um, your tithes and offerings in the offering boxes surrounding this room. So we invite you to do that. And also let you know we are, we are still looking for volunteers as we begin to kick open more environments after Easter. So you can learn more there. Talk with me or Tammy, our children's director. And then um, finally, I have one closing announcement. I want to invite Gretchen Konis to come forward. And she is just going to say a big thank you for how God has been at work in the midst of our church during this past year. So Gretchen, uh, we're going we're gonna to let you send us out with a word of hope. Nope, you got it. Uh, <laughs> Usually when I hold this, I shake. Okay. Uh, you know what? I'm Gretchen Konis, and God is my servant king. I am proud to be here today and let you know that I am your servant leader here at Harvest Point, representing Operation Christmas Child. And during the month of March, letters went out to churches all over the country, thanking them and letting them know how uh, grateful Samaritan's Purse is for their contribution. So here's the report. The report is that this church, with other churches in the South Metro area, sent 24,000 shoeboxes to children wow. around the world. 24,000. That's 24,000 opportunities for a child to know our King Jesus. Mm. And in the United States alone, we uh, sent 7.1 million shoeboxes, and with countries throughout the world, 9.5 million shoeboxes wow. were sent. Wow. Praise the God. The responsibility we have as Christians, you can help right here. It's a shoebox. It's simple, but it means a lot, and it can change a child's life for eternity. Thank you. After Christmas, you'll see evidence after Christmas. You're getting ahead of yourself. You're like well, Dollar General, getting ahead of, getting ahead of us here. That. After Easter, you'll see evidence in the uh, lobby of us starting to collect. And I, I just want to say, I just want to say thankful. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are such an amazing church. I'm so proud to be part of this. So here we go. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Gretchen, for your servant leadership. Um, and this morning, as you go out from this place, I, I want to invite you on your car ride home to reflect on somebody who needs hope this Easter. Reflect on somebody who, who's maybe experienced hurt, brokenness, who's in need of an experience of God's love. And I invite you, just send them a text, give them a phone call, say, hey, come, come and join me. Come and join us next Easter. We hope to see you then. God bless you and have a great day. We love you and God loves you too.